Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to 3 News Now. I'm Stephanie Haney. It's Tuesday, March 2nd. Thanks for choosing to be here for the top stories from WKYC.com and our WKYC app. We start off with news related to the Tribe organization with another report from The Athletic about the behavior of former Tribe pitching coach Mickey Calloway. Now, there's reports coming out from The Athletic that it's possible the Tribe might have been aware of some bad behavior on the part of Mickey Calloway that is at least seemingly potentially related to some of the things he's being investigated by Major League Baseball for. So we'll start with what's happening today and then give you a refresher on what happened in the past. Previously, Tribe President Chris Antonetti said he was unaware of any inappropriate behavior on the part of Calloway until reading a report that came out in February, but now there's a report today that says that manager Tito Francona, Antonetti, and general manager Mike Chernoff had confronted Callaway when he was the pitching coach for the Tribe about an extramarital affair that he had with a woman in 2017 that came to Cleveland baseball's attention. So according to the report out today, there was a man from Arizona who contacted Major League Baseball and the Tribe after discovering that Callaway was allegedly having a consensual affair with his wife and had sent her, quote, explicit photos and at least one lewd video. That's the part that will be important later. Now, according to one former team employee, Antonetti, Chernoff, and Francona discussed the matter with Callaway, and the Cleveland area lawyer representing Callaway also told the woman on a recorded phone call that the tribe was upset with Callaway and that he sensed the pitching coach had been fined more than $100,000. Well, in a statement provided to The Athletic, the tribe denied disciplining Callaway and said that, yes, in June of 2017, they received reports from a man alleging extramarital contact between Mickey and his wife over a two-year period. Within days of the report, we spoke with Mickey about the alleged behavior, and he maintained that the relationship was consensual and outside of the workplace. Following our conversation with Mickey, and to our knowledge, there were no further complaints of misconduct from this person, referring to the Arizona man, during Mickey's tenure with the club, talking about while he was a pitching coach with the Tribe. The Tribe told 3 News, while our organization continues to cooperate with Major League Baseball on their Mickey Calloway investigation, we cannot comment any further at this time. And today, Tito Francona spoke during press conferences, and he said that he didn't think it was the appropriate time to address the team's handling of allegations against Callaway. Here's what he said. I know the organization is putting out a response. Out of respect to that and the Major League Baseball investigation right now is just not the right time to respond to some of the questions I'm sure you have. I do hope at some point we are able to because I think we need to. Just know that we take this very, very seriously. I apologize, but that's kind of where it is today. And then he was pressed a bit by reporters. He went on to say, nobody's ever deliberately covered up for anybody. I can tell you that, okay? All right, so now let's go back to what happened, that earlier report that came out in February. Allegations are that Callaway aggressively pursued at least five women who work in sports media. Here's the part where it's potentially looking like the tribe might have been aware of some of the problematic behavior. He's accused of sending three of them inappropriate photographs and asking one of them to send new fo nude photos in return. And that previous report says that he sent women unsolicited messages and regularly commented on their appearance in a manner that made them uncomfortable. Well, here's what Callaway said in February. Rather than rush to respond to these general allegations of which I have just been made aware, I look forward to an opportunity to provide more specific responses. He told The Athletic, any relationship in which I was engaged has been consensual and my conduct was in no way intended to be disrespectful to any women involved. I am married and my wife has been made aware of these general allegations. He has been married to his wife, Anna, for 19 years. So that's the latest there. Again, right now, the tribe not commenting on these new allegations brought forward to accept for Francona to say that no one has ever deliberately covered up for anyone. And we will continue to follow that on WKYC.com, our WKYC app, and also on our broadcasts today. Now, in health news, Ohio's new health director, Stephanie McLeod, has signed revised orders allowing for spectators at sporting events and entertainment venues. These go into effect today. So according to the first order, these are revisions of the first order that prohibited mass gatherings. Well, now events can go forward as long as COVID-19 protocols are followed. This includes your wedding receptions, 
funerals, proms, and other major gatherings. And also, more than 300 people are now allowed to attend events held at banquet centers here in the state of Ohio, as long as the venue enforces other health orders and guidelines, so that physical distancing still needing to be in place and all of those other things. Now, there was a separate amendment addressing sporting events and other major gatherings, both outside and inside. Director McLeod, with this signing of the revised order, has authorized 25% capacity at indoor sporting events, 30% at outdoor sporting events. So you're talking about your progressive field, for example, there. And for entertainment-led events, the same rules apply. 25% indoors, 30% outdoors. And those went into effect today, according to Governor DeWine's office. Now let's talk about the latest COVID-19 numbers across the globe and across the U.S. These numbers come from Johns Hopkins University. Globally, the total number of reported COVID cases is now at 114,638,948. The total number of reported COVID deaths is now at 2,543,271. And we maintain a significant lead in the number of cases and the number of deaths here in the U.S. compared to the global level. We've got 4% of the global population, but we have 25% of the COVID-19 cases and 20.3% of the COVID-19 deaths. Here in the U.S., the total number of reported cases is now at 28,678,537. The total number of deaths is now at 515,337 people who have lost their lives related to COVID-19. Here in Ohio, we have the latest numbers from the Ohio Department of Health. New cases reported up today from yesterday, 1,709 new cases in the last 24 hours. The data not yet available on the number of new deaths reported in the last 24 hours. But taking a look at the most recent percentage of COVID-19 tests that have come back positive, we take a look to Sunday, where 4.3% of about 16,000 COVID tests came back positive, so just under 700 there. And our seven-day average has dropped again. It's now at 3%, which is below that World Health Organization recommended threshold of 5%. Some good news there. Now, in the last 24 hours, there have been 121 new hospitalizations related to COVID. That number is up from yesterday. The total number of people in the hospital, though, is down from yesterday. And if you remember yesterday, we had the first increase in this number in two weeks, but back down again today to 1,131 people being treated right now in the hospital for COVID-19. And right now, there are 295 people being treated in the ICU out of that group of people. That's no change from yesterday. But we have seen 12 new ICU admissions in the last 24 hours. Taking a look at vaccinations here in Ohio right now, almost 939,000 people have been completely vaccinated. That's just over 8% of the population and 26,000 more people in the last day. This is as we wait for those single dose shots to arrive here in Ohio from Johnson & Johnson, expecting hopefully 100,000 of those this week. And in terms of the people who have started the vaccination process, again, these are the people who are getting that two-shot vaccine from both Moderna and Pfizer. We've got about a little over 1.7 million people who have started that process, so about 14.8% of the population here in Ohio. Switching gears, if you are in the market for a gas vehicle, you might want to get on that pretty soon because it might not be available soon. Volvo has now announced that they will only be making electric vehicles by 2030. This is the latest automaker to make this commitment, and it's something that we're seeing picking up steam. Automakers around the world are really ramping up producing electric vehicles, and this is happening because governments are imposing stricter pollution regulations. So Volvo, which is a Swedish automaker, said it's phasing out production of all cars with internal combustion engines. That includes hybrid vehicles. The Volvo's chief technology officer, Henrik Green, said there's no long-term future for cars with an internal combustion engine. GM pledged that it will only be making battery-powered vehicles by 2035, so a little bit longer there. Now, Volvo said that while its electric vehicles will be sold exclusively online, yes, you will have to buy this online, dealerships will still be important. They'll still be a crucial part of the customer experience. That's where you'll go for a variety of important services, including the selling and preparing and delivering and the servicing of the cars. But here's just a quick window into how quickly this will work for you. Remember, Volvo said... Only electric vehicles by 2030. Well, it's 2021 right now, and they're only just now unveiling their second fully electric car. This is a follow-up to last year's XC40 Recharge. That's a compact SUV. 
And Volvo says its goal is to have half of its global sales be fully electric by 2025 with the remaining half made up of hybrids. So still, you're not going to be able to get just a straight up gas vehicle from them coming up here pretty quickly. So just keep that in mind if you're in the market for a vehicle and you're thinking about making the transition to electric because it seems like you just might not have choice here very soon. Now, we've been talking about what the Cleveland Browns will do in free agency, and today we're taking a look at the top cornerback contenders. This is analysis from our three news sports analyst, Ben Axelrod. Here's two potential prospects. One is William Jackson III from the Cincinnati Bengals. We looked at a prospect from the Bengals yesterday for the defensive end position. Well, Jackson is arguably the top free agent cornerback on the market this year. He had 11 pass defenses and one interception in 14 games with the Bengals last season. He was selected first round in the 2016 NFL draft and pro football focus ranks him the number 20 quarterback last season, the number 16 overall free agent. He's projected to have a nice contract coming his way, a three year, $40 million contract. This is projected by pro football focus and the Browns could do that. They could offer that up with the cap space that they have with the NFL salary limitations that are also, by the way, decreasing next year. Another potential possibility, we could have a Pittsburgh Steeler putting on the brown and orange. Mike Hilton is a prospect. Now, Kevin Johnson is set to become a free agent, so we don't just need someone to start against start opposite Denzel Ward, but also at Nickelback. And Mike Hilton, he entered the NFL as an undrafted free agent in 2016, He's got a reliable track record at Nickelback, and he could immediately fill that void for the Browns. If the Browns opt to go after multiple cornerbacks on the free agent market, it's possible they might want to go after Hilton. Now, for other potential possibilities for targets for the Browns at the cornerback position, check out that story from Ben Axelrod on WKYC.com and our WKYC app. And with it being March... It is Women's History Month. Here's a fun little piece of trivia for you. Women's History Month started is a week, a single week. And it was a single week for about five years before it eventually expanded to a month. And now we use the entire month of March to celebrate women's history. And what we want to do is we want to celebrate the women who have changed your world. We want to know all about the important, impactful women in your life. And we want you to submit stories about these women to us at 3 News by emailing your say at wkyc.com. That's Y-O-U-R-S-A-Y, your say at wkyc.com. We would love for you to include a photo of this incredible woman in your life and a description of why this woman deserves to be recognized. And we'll review all of those submissions and we'll feature some of them on What's New at 5 p.m. and also on wkyc.com. Now remember, when you make the submission, we need your name, the city that you're contacting us from, and a phone number so that we can get a hold of you. Of course, we'll also have your email, but we need to know who we're talking to since you'll have emailed us the submission at yoursay at wkyc.com. But make sure you send that to us so that we can celebrate the incredible women in your life all throughout the the month of March. That's it for today's Three News Now update for Tuesday, March 2nd. I'll see you next up on What's New with your trending stories in the Clicking in Cleveland segment, and I will see you back here tomorrow for even more three news now. Between now and then, everyone enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Stay safe and be well. I'm Stephanie Haney.